Hello everybody, my name is Paul Ralph and today I'm going to be talking to you about how we kind of don't teach design in software engineering and information systems. So to give you an idea about the motivation for this talk, I did two undergraduate degrees. I did an undergraduate degree in computer science uh, focusing in software engineering and an undergraduate degree in business focusing in information systems. And I was really interested in design. And I noticed that these programs weren't really teaching me design. I mean, there were courses that had design in the title. There was algorithm design. But algorithm design was really just the study of existing algorithms and trying to understand how they work. And there were courses like software engineering where you had to build something. But you almost always built something that already existed. You were just re-implementing some idea someone already had. It wasn't new. It wasn't innovative. And there was general guidance. Things like create four, generate four alternatives and then pick the best one. Probably a good idea, but the question was, how do you generate the alternatives? Where do these alternatives come from? And that's what we didn't really talk about that. And I used to ask questions about it and never really got any satisfactory answers. So that got me thinking, is, is it just me? Is it just my program? Is it just my experience? Is it, or is this a more general thing? Now, about 60% of software developers take one of three programs, either computer science, software engineering, or information systems. We already know that computer science does not really prepare people for a career in programming. There's already some good research on that. But we don't know about software engineering and information systems. Now, there are three different ways to go about analyzing this problem. There's looking at programs in practice. So this is, this is going into classrooms or surveying students or instructors and looking at what is actually taught. That's important. And the second thing is looking at the programs on paper. So what is supposed to be taught, what's in the university calendars, what is advertised in the websites, what is, what is supposed to be covered. And then there's the third one that's sort of interesting is uh, the model curricula. So the Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM, and the Association for Information Systems, the AIS, publish these model curricula for undergraduate degrees and postgraduate degrees, etc. So the, uh, the information systems model curriculum is sort of a joint publication between the ACM and the AIS, uh, and the software engineering model curriculum is, is just an ACM one. Now, this makes a really good place to start because these model curricula are, are tractable, they're very analyzable. Um, they're, they're written in structured documents. You can really get, um, you can really get robust analysis on them, whereas the other two are kind of more challenging. So while all three are important, we're going to start with the model curricula because the problem is more tractable. Now, how do you analyze the model curricula? That depends. It depends on your ideological viewpoint on how people design things. And there are two broad ideological viewpoints. The rational model is the way engineers, broadly speaking, think about design. Uh, and the empirical model is the way product designers and industrial designers generally think about design. Um, I am not interested in getting into an ideological battle over which, is the, which of these is correct. So I'm just going to use both. We'll just use both of them as the basis for coding schemes and move on. To give you a little more, uh, a little more background, the rational model is largely proposed by Herbert Simon, uh, Nobel laureate in economics, who said that you design things according to seven basic activities. Uh, the first one is you have to choose among design candidates. This is what we already talked about. Generate four design candidates, choose the best one. Uh, but to do that, you have to be able to evaluate the design candidates. And to do that, you need imperative logic. Now, imperative logic, uh, which is now called deontic logic in philosophy, is the logic of shoulds, the logic of what should happen or what ought to happen. So it's the idea that you can derive from present conditions uh, an imperative, an, an optative statement about what should, what should happen. Um, then there's the search for design candidates. So Simon envisioned the design candidate generation process as a heuristic search through a solution space. So you imagine this n-dimensional space that contains all the different uh, possible solutions plotted according to their, um, their properties, the values of all of their properties. And that we would search, the designer searches through that space uh, to identify good ones, the, the hills, the, the local maxima in the space. Uh, and then you just pick the best one of the good ones that you find. 
So if you're going to do that kind of search, you have to allocate resources for the search, figure out how to go about it. Uh, hierarchy is um, Simon's shorthand for the structure of designed objects. He saw designed objects as being innately hierarchical. And last year to represent design problems. So if you're going to do any of this stuff, you need to be able to uh, see the design problem, to, to, to draw it, to write it down somehow so that you can better understand it. The empirical model is, like I said, the way that product designers and industrial designers view design. Uh, and the empirical model is a bit different from the rational model. So I wrote my dissertation on SCI theory up here. SCI theory is my theory of how people design software, and it sort of explains how, it's, it's the alternative to Simon's view, it explains how people go about building software if you, if you accept the empirical model of assumptions. Uh, briefly, it says that designers engage in three basic activities. Uh, sense making is making sense of the world. It is, it is your perceiving of the world and your organizing your perceptions about the world. Uh, this creates a mental picture of the context of the world in which you exist. Um, this includes both the world the designer exists in and the world in which you are going to uh, deploy the artifact. So if you're building the Mars rover, it includes both your offices in Texas somewhere and Mars. Uh, so that we, have, we use context as a shorthand for both of those things. Coevolution is a rapid oscillation between your understanding of the problem and your understanding of the thing you are going to build to solve that problem. Um, this is not evolution. Evolution is gradual improvement in an artifact. Coevolution is the gradual mutual improvement of two artifacts. So you have two artifacts in your, now these aren't really artifacts, they're things in your head, but you have these two different things in your mind, your mental picture of the world and your mental picture of some object in the world, or some object that you're going to build in the world. And your attention oscillates between the two objects. And as you come to understand the thing that you're going to build better, it triggers better understanding of the world. And then as you understand the world better, it triggers better ideas about what to build. So we oscillate rapidly back and forth. Coevolution happens in minutes and hours. It should not be confused with evolutionary prototyping. Evolutionary prototyping is when you build something, deploy it into a domain or a subdomain of where it's going to go, and then it changes the world, and then you react to those changes in the world, uh, and then you change the prototype. That happens in weeks or months. Okay, so these are different time scales. SCI theory has two iterative loops. The short iterative loop is represented by coevolution. The long iterative loop is the path on the outside from context to mental picture of context to mental picture of design object to the design object, and which is in the context. So implementation is building. It is converting your mental picture of the world or your mental picture of a design artifact into that design artifact which is in the world. Now, why have I constructed this? Um, I constructed this because the language that we usually use to talk about design and practice uh, is misleading. The language we usually use, we talk about phases or activities like analysis, design, implementation, and testing, or analysis, design, coding, and testing. There are a lot of problems with this language. Um, don't underestimate the power of language to confuse people. So if we want to talk about analysis, well, there's two very different kinds of analysis that go on in a design project. There's the kind of analysis that happens when you're talking to a client and trying to figure out what they want and what they need, and you're writing notes and you're trying to make sense of your notes. And that is, is tightly coupled with, uh, with talking to clients. And there's a different kind of analysis that is done in, des in what we call design meetings, um, where you're rapidly analyzing the world and the thing that you're building and bouncing back and forth. And that kind of analysis is tightly coupled with coevolution. Okay? Another example of this is testing. And lots of different kinds of testing. Unit testing, this is the kind of testing where we build automated tests that we run against a code base, is tightly coupled with programming. It's something that programmers do. It, um, when you run a code base against a set of unit tests, or vice versa, um, you find bugs, you find lots and lots of bugs. Most of those bugs are problems with the code, but some of those bugs are problems with the tests. And so we have the code base and the unit tests as codependent artifacts, and when we run one against the other, 
we improve both of them. We find the bugs in both of them. So that means that unit testing is tightly coupled with programming. Unit testing is tightly coupled with programming. But acceptance testing, the kind of testing where you bring a prototype to a client, say, what do you think about this, is tightly coupled with what we usually call analysis. This causes a lot of confusion. Uh, we can straighten that out using this model, or at least that's what it's for. Now, this model lends itself to a very simple coding scheme. Um, you can code topics as being something related to sense making, something related to coevolution, or something related to implementation. Um, you will notice here that I've highlighted number four in red. That is because it's the search for design candidates that I think is missing. This is the thing that wasn't in, wasn't in any courses. This is the thing we never talked about. The search for design candidates is the really important thing that seems to be missing. In the same way, coevolution is the really important thing that seems to be missing. I expect they'll find all kinds of stuff about sense making and implementation. We talk about those things a lot, even though we don't use the word sense making. We talk about that a lot. This is important. If I was looking for the word coevolution in the model curricula, that wouldn't be fair, because this is not the language that is used in software engineering or in information systems. I'm not looking for the words. I'm looking for the content. I'm looking for the idea. So, we can take the ACM model curricula for software engineering or, and the AIS model curricula for information systems and compare them against both model curricula. So that's what we did. Or, sorry, against both coding schemes. So that's what we did. Now what do we find? So first thing is, when we look at, um, we look at the information systems curricula, which is divided up into courses and then topics within each course, and then we compare them to Simon's curricula, we get, we get lots and lots of stuff that's not applicable. That's not a problem. We expect that. That's not a problem because um, Simon's curricula is about designing stuff. And information systems is not just about designing stuff. It's about a whole bunch of other things like enterprise systems and project management. So all those topics are not going to fit into Simon's curricula. The large number of not applicable things, not a problem. Not a problem. But those zeros at the end of the columns of two, three, and four, that's a problem. That means that we are not covering those things. Number four is design, is the search for design candidates. There are simply no topics in the information systems model curricula that have anything to do with the heuristic search for design candidates. There is heuristic search, like the idea of heuristic search in computer science where you have a list of objects and you have to search for the highest one or whatever. That's there, but it is not applied to a design space. It is not applied to design thinking. It's simply not in the curriculum. Similarly, if we take the information systems uh, model curriculum, we, we code it according to SCI theory, we get, again, there's a whole bunch of stuff that is not, app not applicable. There's a whole bunch of stuff that just doesn't, is not sense making coevolution or implementation. That's because it's other IS topics and that is not a problem. How, and we're doing pretty good on sense making. That's because there's a lot of research on conceptual modeling in information systems. And that has found its way into the curriculum. And conceptual modeling, this is, this is making models of the world, is closely related to sense making. We also have lots of stuff about implementation uh, because there's a course in application development and a course in human computer interaction that involves a lot of development. And so we talk a lot, there's a lot of programming, there's a lot of uh, programming related testing that goes on. But there's nothing about coevolution. It's just not there. I wasn't expecting just not there. I was expecting not very many topics about coevolution, but there just aren't any. There's nothing there. There's nothing related. There's evolutionary prototyping, but as we discussed before, evolutionary prototyping is a totally different thing than coevolution. Evolutionary prototyping happens in weeks or months. Coevolution happens in minutes or hours. The results for software engineering are very similar. I'm not going to go through them in the interest of time, um, but. It's this, in general, the software engineering curriculum was better. It has more coverage of core sort of programming implementation topics, um, but it does not have anything about coevolution. It doesn't have anything about, um, doesn't have anything about the search for design alternatives. If there is one topic about the psychology of HCI where you might be able to talk about coevolution depending on who was teaching it, but it's not very likely. 
Um, there are a bunch of things in both curricula that just don't code very well because they're either very general or they entirely depend on the instructor. So one of the things in the software engineering model curriculum is a design method. You know, teach a design method. Well, if you told me to teach a design method, I would probably teach a design method that uses the word coevolution. <laughs> but there's no guarantee of that, and most design methods don't talk about coevolution, don't talk about the heuristic search for design candidates. Uh, so it really depends on the instructor. And there are some very general things like engineering design. In the software engineering curriculum, there's engineering design. What does engineering design mean? It's the software engineering curriculum. <laughs> it, the engineering design seems like the topic of the whole curriculum. So again, if somebody had an interest in coevolutionary thinking or the search for design candidates, you might use that topic as a place to talk about it, but no guarantees. The other problem with the cur model curricula is that they don't, they don't prescribe how to teach each topic. They're just lists of topics, and you're supposed to know um, how, to do, how to do them. So maybe if there was a description that said, and by this topic we mean we, you should talk about coevolution, then it would count. But there, is no, there are no such descriptions. So to code them, we had to look at sort of the popular understanding of terms. You know, a lot of looking at Wikipedia. Now you might question the validity of looking at Wikipedia, but if you have to teach a topic with which you are unfamiliar, the first place you look tends to be Wikipedia. Um, so I think it's a good source of understanding the popular conception of a term. So what does this mean? First thing is, the IS model curriculum, more generally, is not appropriate for teaching software developers. It is simply insufficient. There isn't nearly enough, there's one course in application development that basically crams in all the core ideas for an from an entire software engine engineering degree into one single term course. That's just not enough. That isn't enough practice, it's not enough projects, it's not enough exposure to programming concepts. The idea that there is this career path in the IS curriculum for software developers is bad. It's just not practical. Uh, and we probably shouldn't be promoting our IS degrees as such. Second thing about this is we need to start teaching design. And when I say we need to start teaching design, I mean that um, there are a great many things that can be taught. So some people tend to treat design as uh, this artistic creative thing that can't be taught, can't be learned, it's just something that you have. It's like being a great painter, except great painters spend thousands of hours practicing painting, and great designers spend thousands of hours practicing designing. Uh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. There are lots of good things that we can teach. There's lots of stuff like breadth first versus depth first search. This is a very technical term in computer science, but it also applies to the way that we understand design thinking. Designers tend to engage in depth first search. They come up with a single solution candidate and dive into it. They go way down the rabbit hole. And once you've gone way down the rabbit hole, it's very hard to climb back out. Because once you've made sort of the big decisions and you start, you start going down into the details, confirmation bias kicks in and my side processing kicks in and fixation kicks in and it becomes very difficult to shake your initial assumptions about what you've designed. It's much more efficient to do a breadth first search and identify four design candidates like they teach you in first year engineering and pick the best one. We can talk about design fixation. This is the tendency, as I just mentioned, to um, get hung up on a particular aspect or of the design or a particular idea to, and, and to the point that it blinds you to all else. We can talk about the meaning of coevolution. This is just general stuff. You introduce the idea of coevolution and say, look, this is normal. It is normal for you to have meetings where a bunch of guys stand around a whiteboard and draw some design can draw models of some design candidates, and then that triggers a, a new understanding of the world. And so it's very useful to have representatives of the client in that design meeting to help verify or at least provide some kind of check on your new understanding in the world. We, can, we, must, we have to talk about things like scenario writing and personas. These are things that can help uh, solidify your vague notions about what you're doing. Um, scenarios are narratives. They're written descriptions of things that might happen. Personas are like character sketches. They're uh, descriptions of an imaginary user. They're a thing that you use when you don't have access to real users. We can talk about 
and the difference between design spaces and solution spaces. This is just not really mentioned in our curricula. There's this metaphor that we use to understand design where we have a design space that has, uh, sorry, not design space and solution spaces, uh, problem spaces and design spaces. We have this sort of metaphoric space that contains our understanding of the problem we are approaching. We have a metaphoric space that contains our understanding of the solution. And it is very, very important that you don't get those mixed up. If you start getting your understanding of the solution mixed up with your understanding of the problem, then you unnecessarily limit your design space. It's like when you're, you're trying to make a game, and you, a video game, and you decide, we're going to make a game for a console. No, better. We're going to make a, design, a game for an iPhone. We want to make an iPhone game. So we, we start building our iPhone game. iPhone game wasn't part of the problem. Game was part of it. We want to make a game. iPhone is a design, so is a, is a design decision. We decided that we want to deploy this to this domain. But we mix that up and we think it's part of the problem. So then when our game development goes really well and it starts to get out of hand and this thing is starting to get too big to be played on a phone, it's very difficult to say, wait a minute, why were we doing a phone anyway? If we've got something that's really this big and it's going to be this successful, why don't we deploy it to consoles? It's very difficult to think that way if you get your understanding of the solution mixed up with your understanding of the problem. Uh, and there are lots of other things that we can talk about and teach students about that help with design thinking. Uh, it is not simply an art. Um, it is a skill that can be taught and can be learned. And that is my presentation. Thank you for coming. Thank you.